Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. My name is Bill Lester. I'm here with University of Florida IFAS Extension Service in Hernando County. And joining me today is my regular co-host, Lily Browning. Good morning, Bill and Bernie. Our Hernando County Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator. And she doesn't coordinate the landscape. She just coordinates the, the teaching part. Right. Yes, especially in the summer. It's too hot. <laughs> well, it's beautiful outside. What are you talking about? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You you like and soak in the heat. You enjoy the heat. I, I get used to it. I don't, it doesn't really bother me that much. And we have our master gardener, Bernie, who knows a little bit about everything lawn and garden wise. And, anybody and everything knows? else. And everything else. <laughs> a little bit about everything, yeah. <laughs> well, I try to uh, answer as honestly as possible. It, it's very rare that I'm forced to make things up. So uh, if, if you want to know the truth, I probably have got it. Or I, I do know how to say I don't know, but I can find out. And yeah. I, I have some very brilliant people that I work with, and I can find out. So. Uh, thanks for being letting me be here. That's what I and always say. And if about. you live in Hernando County and you have a question for Bernie, there is our phone number to our office down there. Bernie's here pretty much every Thursday from first thing in the morning until middle of the Three afternoon. Three o'clock? Three o'clock. Three-ish. <laughs> yeah, he won't and get up. If you're in the middle of a conversation, he won't get up and leave you at three o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> And he usually does a little short video that we post on our Facebook page every Thursday afternoon based on a question he answered or something that somebody brought in that day, something unusual. So be sure to check that out also. You know what I was reminded of, Bernie, in our long history together? Bernie and I, I was already working at County Extension in a clerical function, and Bernie and I took master gardener training at the same time and for our i would just always remember for our final exam there was a plant id portion and what was it that just wasn't coming to your mind chamber <laughs> uh, was, bitter chamber bitter the weed yep. and he was just sitting at the table like oh i can't remember this <laughs> yeah. obviously he passed anyway and has been doing fantastic ever since Almost every master gardener I've ever known is a person who loves to learn. And I think once you stop being curious, basically you stop living. <laughs> and, and, you know, Bernie has a lot of curiosity and he always, when, you know, like you said, when he doesn't know something, he doesn't just drop it. That, that's the fact. I don't know. He's going to find it out. And that's, that's, that's really cool people to hang out with. You know, I, I really love the people that come in with the, the really tough questions because uh, it, it tells you what you really need to learn. And it, it's amazing uh, some of the really unique problems. I had a, a fellow one time that had streaks in his yard. and uh, Streaks? Streaks. Okay. And, and they, they ran kind of parallel. Not and, people. Not people, streaking. No, not streakers. <laughs> okay. Okay. And, and they, they were all, they, they varied, but they would run from eight to, to 10 inches wide. And, and they were parallel. And uh, he thought that it was some kind of a, a bug or that was something because his neighbor told him, what's the one thing your neighbor always tells you is wrong when you have something in your brown spot in your yard? You've got chinch bugs. So he wanted to know if chinch bugs cause this. And I said, well, it, with, with the fact that the, the streaks are parallel, it, it's not an insect or something. I, I said, this looks like it's an artifact from mowing. Oh, no. He said, I just got a new mower. And uh, I said, is it leaking gasoline? <laughs> yeah, it does. He said, that's why the, the, the no, dog no. stinks all the time, isn't it? Yeah, and every time the, the mower was running, it would sit there and it would spit gasoline. So as he mowed, he was gassing the yard. Oh, my gosh. And the groundwater and everything else. 
It's a really good thing he didn't smoke while he mowed, huh? It would have been funny to have a big flame chasing you and running this mower wide open trying to get away from it. So. Wow. No, I hadn't heard that story before. But I, I just thought that was interesting that you, <laughs> you run into things that, that uh, you know, those, those situations that are really unusual. And, and those are the most interesting things. The, the, the person that comes in and they, they've got a bug or, or whatever, and, and uh, this is the 30th time you've seen it this month. Right. Uh, that, that's not all that exciting. Remember that uh, when when we first started having trouble with Asian cycad scale on the uh, sago palm, it, it was really kind of exciting to have somebody come in and say, my sago has turned white. Mm-hmm. Well, after that happens 50 or 100 times, it wasn't so exciting to say, well, you've got Asian cycad scale. You, know, it's, mm-hmm. you just whip off the little form and, and hand it to them and say, here's your, here's your problem. And uh, well, and hearing the same things over and over, like I said, I was in a clerical role. I was actually the secretary for the horticulture agent at um, County Extension. So you hear the same things over and over and over. And as I was not a master gardener, I wasn't officially allowed to answer some of the questions. So what I would often do is while I'm doing my work and I would pass the phone calls on to the master gardener, I would also then just walk by their desk with a publication you know, that had the answer for them. <laughs> And the director at the time said, you know what, you know, you can answer these questions. So why don't you just take the master gardener training so that when you do, you're covered under that umbrella of being a master gardener. And then Bernie and I, you know, continued for the length of time I worked at Extension, which was until 09, um, to work as partners, you know, when we were, when he was on duty and, and, uh, you know, I, I was like right close to him. So we, we helped each other answering a lot of the questions. I thought it was interesting when you were uh, going to college and you were learning all the Latin names. That, that was uh, a, a good time for me because I had to learn all these Latin names to try and keep up with your people. With yes, college. yes. Then I decided, yes, after taking the Master Gardener training, I'm going to go to college for horticulture. So at the same time, um, even though he didn't pay for it, Bernie also went to college because I would hand over my uh, books and everything, and he'd spend all the time reading all the stuff that I was doing. So <laughs> it was great. Okay, I just put a couple of comments in the chat. I went ahead and put a link to our very, very short survey which just um, for our regular viewers, you only have to take the survey once. So please don't take it over and over, kind of throws off our numbers a little bit, but we want to get an idea of, I, I know that we're entertaining. I know that we hold your attention, but are you actually learning something by viewing us and listening to us? So whether you're watching us live or recorded, go ahead and click on that link. It's just a couple questions to get an idea of um, how we're benefiting our audience and I threw in a link to the uh, Hernando County government's YouTube channel because both Lily and I have lots of our classes that we recorded and put there. So how many are you up to now, Lily? Well, 110 today. Um, <laughs> there, there, John's working on the one that we did <laughs> a few weeks ago, but that's going to take more work because it's not just a Zoom class. It was an out in the field thing and he needs to do a lot of editing um hopefully and then our, hopefully the footage works for him i just i just downloaded it and yeah. shared it um and tomorrow i have a lunch and learn um unwelcome guests in the garden so i will send that to him <laughs> when i am done with it um you can either attend live or watch it on facebook that a you know, few hours after or a few days after when john uh it's it on the, the YouTube channel. So yeah, now you, you can go right now. I've been dealing with people um, with rain barrel workshops who are not in Hernando County. So- um, Aren't you supposed to be in Hernando County if you wanna to go to the- Correct. So okay. what I'm telling them is I have recorded one of my virtual rain barrel workshops that I gave to people. You know, mm-hmm. I recorded that one 
And so it's available on Hernando County YouTube. You, it does not qualify you to get a rain barrel. <laughs> you do have to be a Hernando County resident and you have to attend a live workshop. I have to see your face and look in your eyes for you to get a rain barrel, you know, but the exact same information, if you only want the information, it's also on YouTube. It's called Recycling Raindrops. It's literally a rain barrel workshop. You just don't get a barrel from it. So I just sent it to somebody in another county yesterday. I told her we're having a virtual one on June 8th in the evening that she's welcome to attend. She's just not eligible, you know, to pick up a barrel. Mm -hmm. Or she can just watch this one on her own, um, you know, her own leisure time. So if you're thinking, I oh, mean, I wish I could at least learn about rain barrels, go to the YouTube and, you know, we'll, we'll give you our. What it doesn't do is give you step by step by step instructions on how to build a rain barrel. That's not, you know, we have rain barrels. There's that a huge amount of information online, other yeah. YouTube channels. Right. So and uh, barrels, the pickle, pickle barrels and all kinds of stuff. Southwest Florida Water Management District has a booklet online on how to build your own. The deal we have for Hernando County residents, our bulk cost is $65 per barrel. That's what we pay. And it's basically a barrel that is almost built. It comes with a kit that you add a spigot and an overflow hose. Um, if you are a customer of Hernando County Utilities, you get a one-time credit of on your water bill of $30. So it's a really good deal for our customers because you can't go out, find a pickle barrel, find a spigot, do all this stuff, you know, for $35. You're not going to build one, most likely, for $35. So, but, you know, if that's the route you choose to go, we support that as well. We're not saying you must get a specially designed rain barrel and you know as long as it has a lid that isn't going to attract mosquitoes and you, you want to work out your own we support that as well one of the advantages to using rainwater that uh, nobody seems to discuss is is the fact that uh, rainwater is soft water it, it has a uh, very low ph compared to uh, hose water and the, the plants in Florida really love the, the slightly acid water as opposed to the uh, calcium rich water that comes out of a hose. So uh, it's, I do it's discuss definitely that, better uh, for your plants to use the rainwater. What I, what I say in my workshops is, you know, you stand there with the hose, even me who gets it from a well, um, you know, you stand there with the hose and water your flowers or whatever. And what the response they give you uh, compare to a teenage boy who you want to recognize what you said or your presence or something and they do this that little barely that head nod thing like hey <laughs> that's what <laughs> your plants when you hand water them with a hose does it rains on them they're just about dancing out there and <laughs> i think it is because they've got that water with that perfect ph you know coursing through their system during that time frame. Not to mention the trace elements of nitrogen that they get from the atmosphere, um, the raindrops do, you know, from lightning. So that, that slight lower pH releases a lot of nutrients in the soil. That's when, when you send in uh, a soil test, they actually use a, a very mild acid solution to determine what the nutrients in the soil are. So uh, you're just opening the, the world up to your plants with rainwater. It's a mm -hmm. wonderful program. And uh, I think that, that that was one of the, the things that, that you did and, and that you really did a nice job on. So congratulations on something. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I did one thing right. <laughs> There might I, be done others, but I know that one. Um, and we're having rain barrel palooza uh, in June. Um, we just had one yesterday here at our office. Um, we're going to have one June 8th, which I said is virtual. That'll be in the evening. 
and you will be able to pick up your barrels the following Saturday at the Hernando County Master Gardener Nursery from 8 to 10 because Lily's not being out later than that in this heat. And that's June 8th. June 13th is uh, one here in our office and June 28th is one here in our office. And how do you sign up for a rain barrel workshop? You email me. <laughs> ah, see, I beat you to it. Bill. I'm going for it. <laughs> yes. You email me. That's the very first step to get all of the information. And when you email, please tell me your name, home address, and which date you would like to attend. If you don't remember the dates I said, then ask me to send you the, you know, the list of dates so you can choose. So well, I tell you what, if I had a rain barrel. It'd be pretty dry. No, it I had a big rain the other day. Last week, there was at least two big rains went through my house. On my house, not through my house. We got some, and then the grass will perk up and look good, but then we don't get any for a week or two, and it goes back to looking brown and dusty once again. So as I told my rain barrel class <laughs> yesterday, um, I told them in a month, so I said, June, yesterday was the 17th. So I said, June 17th, between 2 p.m. and 6 p.m., the rainy season will start. <laughs> so <laughs> used to be, we could tell them more detailed than that, right, Bernie? We, we, we would say June 11th, 4 p.m. Absolutely. It's gotten less predictable <laughs> than that. It starts a little later, but when I was growing up here, we didn't have rain in September. And now we have rain all the way through September. So, you know, but it seems to start later than it did. And now September is like one of the height of the tropical storm season. So. Yeah. And the uh, same token, we get these uh, 70, 80 degree days in the first of uh, January. Now it makes it very difficult to know, uh, when, when spring control right right when when do i put pre-emergent down well i'd say december january february and march you know how can you tell anymore yes yeah my lawn is actually looking all pretty hairy <laughs> from the rains we got and i live up there in the royal highlands where it's just sand <laughs> so you know the the few rain i mean that Bahia Freedom Lawn was crunchy and brown till we got a couple rains. Now it's all yep. lush looking again. <clears throat> Did you see Maggie was having some kind of weird stuff going on with the system? Yeah, I went on Facebook and I clicked on the link and it works for me. Okay. Both the links do. So. Okay, because sometimes, you know, odd stuff does happen. Um, we have a Facebook thing. Yeah. When we first started going virtual and all the nefarious people also were going virtual and we didn't have all the lockdowns, you know, good as we should, we ran into some issues. Me more than Bill seemed to attack me more than Bill. Um, but if you ever see like some sort of comment put on a Facebook page that's asking you to go to a link or anything that asks for money, some of Bill's class, for any personal information. Some of Bill's classes do cost a little bit, um, but you would go through Eventbrite or something. Eventbrite, yep. We yeah. use just Eventbrite for collecting charges for a class, and you do that with your credit card online. It's fully secure. Right. So if it's not very obvious that it is them, I'm not going to charge you anything. The rain barrel classes we got we have to pretend it's 1985 and you have to bring me a check <laughs> so there's not ever going to be any kind of online payment you know associated with my classes so just be real careful and don't click on links that random people put in some of the comments and stuff it hasn't really happened in a while i had no, one not for a number of years i had one major <laughs> breach in one of my first online classes where I was hacked. 
<laughs> I just shut it all down. I was hoping nobody saw what I saw, but Teresa told me they did. First, I saw <laughs> people showed up that had ski masks over their faces and no shirts on, but it was definitely like 12 year old skinny, <laughs> you know, body under there. And um, then they took over and were showing cartoon porn. So I shut that down. They just turned the whole thing off. It's like, phew, class over. And it, it was very odd because I started it back up again and every single person just came back except for the bad people, like, okay, let's, let's start again and move on. So it turned out okay, but I immediately had to report myself to county IT <laughs> to tell them what had happened. So yeah, happened? I've never been, uh, I never had that problem, <laughs> but I know that we had a few problems a number of years ago. Since then, Zoom has made a lot of improvements, so it's a lot easier to lock it down and keep people from turning their cameras on and showing inappropriate things. Yes. Um, we generally keep the um, their microphones turned off. People will sometimes have their microphone on and they forget it and then you hear all the background noise and sure. kids yeah. and somebody washing the dishes. Dog, yeah, yes. You have a dog. Yeah, or the husband and wife. No, I said, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I have seen some relatively unusual things on But Zoom. we haven't had oh. issues in a while. Things have gotten much more secure. <laughs> so, hey, if anybody watching has any lawn and garden questions, vegetable garden, palm trees, fruit trees, water resources, whatever, go ahead and put them in the comments. And we will do our best to either answer them directly or find a source that can answer them. Because a lot of times we have to do that. I don't know the answer to every question right off the top of my head. Well, speaking of water resources, I'll give you some answers to questions that have come to me this week um, through the water conservation phone line. Yes, if you have a private well, you are still subject to Hernando County's watering restrictions here in Hernando County. The only question you need to ask yourself is, do I live in Hernando County? Then you are under our one day per week watering um, restrictions. No, there is not a declared drought. These have been in place daily for 12 years. <laughs> um, yeah, um, people keep asking, when did you pass these watering restrictions? 12 years ago. Yes. Uh, the other question. Um, if your company, your lawn company, does a lawn treatment that needs to be watered in, if they provide you that little sign that is dated for that day, you are allowed to water it in. Usually, if you don't have to do it immediately. It's like within 24 hours. So wait till after six. And as long as that sign is updated for that day, yes, you may water in whatever treatment they have done. You, if you yourself decide to do a lawn treatment, you've got to wait to your watering day. Just schedule it for your watering day to water it in. You can't really tell your company, no, you must come on <laughs> Tuesday. So that's why that allowance is made. If someone does it for you that you've paid and they put up the sign, yes, you may water that in, even if it's not your watering day. If you're doing that yourself, schedule it for your watering day. Seed. Wait till June 17th between 2 and 6 p.m. to put down your seed. If you don't, this is a multifaceted answer. If you're just overseeding, throwing seed over any existing plant material whatsoever, that doesn't qualify you for any extra watering. If you are trying either with seed or sod or plugs or whatever to renovate some what they call hot spots, some bare areas, you may water those extra with a targeted means, meaning you hose in hand with a nozzle that turns itself off if you drop it 
or one of those old fashioned hose end sprinklers, just targeting that hot spot bare patch area. You can water those in extra. Um, your plants, your, your garden plants, your flowers, I'm sorry, your flower beds and things, you can hand water those pretty much anytime. You can um, use micro irrigation in those beds. That's not restricted. Your vegetable gardens are not <laughs> under the watering restrictions. They are exempt. I think I got everything. If there's any other questions, <laughs> and if you have a uh, particular zone, irrigation zone where you have 50% or more new plant material, whether that is sod or trees or other plants, has to be 50% or more, you may run just that zone, you know, extra to establish them. Otherwise, you've got to hand water. So. Those are some of the questions I got just so far this week. Well, I have another one for you right here from Bassem. Can I plant a hawthorn tree in Central Florida and what variety that will do good here? And I wasn't really positive. So Lily, while yeah. you're talking, I okay, to we're, let's both look at Bernie. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I'm going to say no, because I haven't heard about them. You can. Well, you can do There's anything. There's a number of different varieties of hawthorns, but um, hawthorns apparently like it partly shady and they like it moist, like the moist edges of wet woodlands, floodplains, a river bank, a creek, something like that. Um, um, what is the other tree that just barely grows here? There's ash trees. Oh, yeah. Ash trees can grow here in Hernando County, but almost none of them do. My sister has The sister only has place you're going to find it is around the edge of a little pond or lake. My sister's in a very, very wet water. area. Her yard is like almost squishy all the time. Yeah. And she, um, our arborist friend, um, found a green ash in her yard, and he was almost just beside himself like <laughs> with joy finding that that there. So I, I, I would say you were taking a chance trying it. So yeah, now we have like English Hawthorns and Parsley Hawthorn and Washington Hawthorn. They're generally more northern May Hawthorn. I'm thinking, another one. I'm thinking you know, maybe North Florida, like Buddy could do better at it. Yeah. <laughs> than the sem. Um, there's a lot more of them north of us than there are here and south of us. Although I'm sitting here looking at May Hawthorn and it grows throughout the state of Florida. Mm. Um, they're in the family Rosaceae. So it's in the Rose family, mm -hmm. which means they're going to be susceptible to a certain number of diseases. Fungal, fungal diseases galore. Yeah. Yeah. So, but Sam, you could try looking online, look up University of Florida Hawthorne trees, and they have separate fact sheets on all those different varieties. You're probably going to have to order one online. I've never seen them for sale at like Home Depot, Lowe's, your neighborhood nursery. They're probably not going to carry them. And you can try them, although that's going to be kind of sketchy. Yeah. <laughs> So Cynthia wants to know the gumbo limbo tree will do well in Tampa. Is that far enough south, Bernie? Not quite. Sarasota, um, maybe. <laughs> yeah. It, it would depend on the, the exact spot in Tampa. If, if you're uh, a long way from the water, probably not. If you got some moderation from the water, uh, Mike, that, yeah. that's good from sarasota south yeah so you you, you probably do it over in st pete uh so if you're by Sefner or so probably not but if you are you know more closer to the water it might stand a chance there again it, it's like jacaranda obviously yeah. you can't grow jacaranda here we're too far north 
but, but you can grow least, them in Newport Ritchie. But yeah. there's at least two of them in the county that are doing well. So everybody I know that has tried it, it's been unsuccessful. I have no idea how these two made it, but it, it's kind of spooky to be driving along during the time that they're in bloom and have this big, beautiful, magnificent tree where it's not supposed to be. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, can't explain it, but it, that has to be just the exact environment and right. the exact yeah. tree that fits that spot. Right plant, right place. And uh, uh, gumbo limbo in Tampa probably is not right plant, right place. But there's an exception to every rule. I got an email a couple of years ago from somebody who had just bought a house in Spring Hill. They said, here's a picture. What kind of tree is this? And it was a mango tree mm -hmm. with mangoes on it. A bunch of mangoes in the backyard in Spring Hill. So it can't, you can do it. It's just difficult. It just has to be in the right magical place. has to be the right plant. Avocados are the same thing. A few people grow them very successfully here. But most people that try it don't do well with it. You know, I, I ride a motorcycle. And when you're out at night on the motorcycle, you really notice the, the temperature changes in various areas. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, there's a place northeast of Brooksville where the, the temperature has to be at least six degrees colder at night than all the surroundings because you're, you're comfortable, you ride through this one spot, and, and it's almost bad enough that you want a jacket. And, and yet, uh, two blocks later, everything's fine again. So uh, I would think that that one little spot, you could probably grow, grow something that's more northern and get by with it. Then, then, and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. these, these places do exist. There, there's warm spots, just like there's, there's cold spots. And if you've got one of those warm spots, you can probably get one of the southern trees uh, to survive. And, and I've, I've seen these things. Uh, there was cassia tree uh, out west that was probably 45 feet tall. It was, it was the biggest cassia in the county, obviously. And it was gorgeous. It, it would have these big yellow blooms. And, and it shouldn't have been there. <laughs> and yet, it, it made it to 45 feet before it got hit and, and, and froze. And, and it, of course, when it's gone, it's gone. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there were some people that had a Confederate rose that, that surprised me because those things usually get nailed every frost. And, and yet this one had made it to a good 25 feet. And, and the one I had had been clipped every year and, and never got above eight or nine feet. But when it finally got nailed, that was over. So. You know, yeah, you you know you put in one of those trees. You you take your chances. I would not spend a lot of money, but you know if, if you really want a gumbo limbo in in Tampa, and you can find one for under fifty bucks, plant it. Yeah. You know that, that the only way you're going to know for sure is to watch it and see if it lives or dies. So I, I am I am a big believer. If you really like something, go ahead and try it. If you're not successful, well, nobody believed you would be. And and if you are successful, <laughs> you know, it's so always it's worth a shot. The exports. It's an experiment. It's uh -huh. that's, all of gardening is an experiment usually. So, and don't don't get frustrated. Um, you know, when things don't work, just give yourself as much knowledge as you can. Understand when you know you realize I'm taking a risk or an experiment here. And even at other times, if you have a failure, you know, the difference between a master and, the, and a novice is the amount of time the master has failed many more times <laughs> than the novice. We fail and we just keep going. And you can't really fail in a garden or in a yard because your failures just become compost. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. you know, it all contributes back, great. <laughs> that contributes back to the health of the ecosystem in your yard there. So 
the most successful gardeners are also the ones with the biggest compost pile. Absolutely. Yes. Yep. And the professionals have way bigger compost piles than the um, just the homeowners because the professionals do not tolerate any poor behavior from the plants yeah. <laughs> like we do. So you're an underperformer. You're now in the compost department. <laughs> Okay, hey, here I have a picture from my out of my email that I got this morning, and I think I know the answer to it. This is from Sandy in Brooksville, and she a vine appeared growing up in her hedge, and she's wondering what it is. Any guesses? It's a morning glory. It looks like a morning glory. Yeah, it does look like morning glory. You know, I could tell you from experience. Vines will show up in your hedges, and you, you're never going to figure out exactly where they came from. I have Virginia creeper, and I have a bunch of skunk vine, and I have um, uh, the vines with the big thorns in them. Greenbrier. The Greenbrier. A couple claw. of other things that pop up in my hedges that I have to crawl my around. My sister and calls that devil up. vine. <laughs> So yeah, if it's a vine, it's going to find your hedge and pop Yeah, up. and I don't think this is a terrible, might even be a native, I'm not sure. Yeah, um, there are a number of native OP, OP, are um, considered agronomic weeds. Yeah, so, o, I mean, you OPO know, something. Yeah. Yeah. That's Morning kind of nice. Are beautiful. Yes. She has a nice plant there. And next watch, we'll find out it's like the most invasive thing <laughs> coming down the yeah, yeah, the most invasive thing. China or something. No. Speaking of Virginia creeper, do you know where I saw bunches and bunches and bunches of Virginia creeper recently? Virginia. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> There's a reason it's named after Virginia. <laughs> we were just camping there. I'm like, wow, look at all this Virginia creeper <laughs> around here. And again, that is a native aggressive yeah. plant, but it's not an invasive plant. It's not one that will change an ecosystem. The, you know, the big, animals problem, big problem with Virginia creeper is that, that as the vine grows, it, it grows in nodes. So it, it puts down a, a, a foot or two feet of vine and, and there's a node and it puts down some roots. And then it goes another foot or two feet, and another node, and and some leaves, and, and and the vine continues. So you you go in to kill it, and and you're very successful. Roundup does a pretty good job, but it only kills it back to that first node going back. And every one of those nodes is capable of regenerating the plant. So you you have, by the, by the time it's climbing up your your tree and, and you finally notice it, you've got 60 feet of vine all through the yard somewhere with 30 nodes. And, and unless you get every one of those, every one of them is capable of regenerating the plant. And, and it becomes a very, very difficult thing to get rid of. You, you not only have to get rid of what you see, you've got to get rid of all the vine that, that's all along the ground. I've never had it be that much of a problem that I've had any great need to do anything about it. It's just kind of there. In fact, I have a story about that. Years ago, our public information um, resource person, her name was Virginia Singer, and um, she works for the Water Management District now. But that's just a side note because my husband and I were in the pool in the evening, and he said, what is that vine? And he's pointing way up in the pine tree, way, way, way up. He goes, what is that? What is that plant up there? What is that vine? And I answered him offhandedly, Virginia Singer. <laughs> and he just looked at me like, what? <laughs> and then I was like, Virginia Creeper. Sorry. <laughs> Virginia's not up in the trees <laughs> looking at us. <laughs> Yeah, if you let them grow for a number of years, the vines will get bigger and thicker. And I tell people when it comes to removing invasives, you have to be diligent. You can't go out there just one and done and all your problems are cured. 
you have to keep checking back when they pop up, pull them up or spray them, however you're dealing with it, and then keep checking. And if you're diligent, you will win eventually. We have way much, a lot of work, way more right? problems with Greenbrier than our Virginia singer doesn't do anything to bother us. Oh, Virginia Green singer, Virginia, Virginia Creeper. <laughs> yes. I've dug up the tubers and they're like this big. It's yeah. they're huge. The Greenbrier is awful. I mean, you it's almost as bad as skunk vine, which um, right now I have very little there in the Royal Highlands where I live of skunk vine. Brooksville is covered in it. So when I moved from Brooksville to the Royal Highlands, I brought nothing, no plants with me because I knew my new yard did not have any skunk vine and I wasn't going to be the one to introduce it. And I'm very particular like about who I take plants from. Um, I have noticed in recent years, tiny bits of it trying to come up. So I always pull it up, you know, probably from neighbors or wherever. So I always try to pull it up. Skunk vine is the one that will, you leave a shovel out and the next day it's going up the shovel, you know, it's, that is, extremely difficult but the green briar which i think grows out there kind of naturally but you have told me there's a you know non-native invasive green briar oh my gosh that's we're fighting that in that extra lot that we bought it grows up the picnic tables it grows up the camper it's just you know everywhere so yeah there's a uf fact sheet on green briar and there's about a dozen species in florida half are native the other half are invasive and very interesting fact sheet. Uh, most of them you can pretty much tell from the leaf shape which one it is. I'm not an expert on ID in them. So. You know, Lily sure Corey says that you can core, eat, you can yeah, eat well, skunk vine as a pot herb. So. Um, can you explain the term pot herb to me? <laughs> because I'm only going one direction with that. But <laughs> and does anybody have any delightful recipes for skunk vine? I don't think I wish to eat it. Well, I will tell you, well, the reason it's named what it is, is because once it is detached from the vine, it's no time at all. I mean, it smells like a very, very old diaper. <laughs> it is, it's, you know, sounds very sewagey, cooked in a stew. My okay. stew. <laughs> okay. Um, and Bernie and I. Um, that is stew. You, you for a short time worked under a uh, director of extension at that time, Dr. Stacy Strickland, who would think it would be fun to take pieces of the skunk vine and put them in my desk drawers or so. <laughs> so you're looking all over the place for this horrendous smell. It's <laughs> really sad, but none of the uh, available, the homeowners products, is is very efficient at killing skunk vine. Yeah. No, it gets in your lawn, and when you mow, you've just spread it everywhere else. There, there's there is actually a, a product for pasture that works great, but it, it's not uh, approved for homeowner for uh, lawn use, and it's a shame. I I, I really wish they had uh, marketed it uh, somewhat restricted use from, uh, for homeowners, but uh, uh, it just it doesn't work but you know if, if you have a pasture and, and you've got a fence row you can get rid of it right up to the fence row and then after that uh, if it gets in your yard there's nothing you can do but pull that stuff and pull that stuff and stress it, it's release go out in the evening and, yeah going out in the evening and pull 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 mm -hmm. <laughs> I think about it when I do when I have to do things like that that seem like you know, a Cicerous kind of job that's never ending. Um, you know, I think of it like, like a police officer. You're not going to get all the crime in the world, but you're going to get what you can do that day. <laughs> so. Yeah, the the uh, forestry service here uh, uses uh, like six percent glyphosate, six percent triclopyr, and it, it's marginally effective uh, neither neither one by themselves is really very effective but i, I would say it's probably only 70 percent effective uh, at, at that concentration that, that 
with two of them, two killers on it. So it it it, it is a vine to be respected. And, you know, there are lots of urban legends out there where various things have come from that usually are not true. Unfortunately, <laughs> the skunk vine legend <laughs> is true. Um, at the research station, USDA research station in a small town of uh, Brooksville, Florida, is where they, in the 40s, was it? decided to grow tell. that as a experiment of a potential fiber crop fiber as in rope i assume not you know edible fiber although maybe i don't know if if uh cory uses it in stew so that is actually true that is where it it got away from so what veggies are we planting this week bill I still need to go out there and start the seeds for um, Seminole pumpkin, which I'm going to try this summer. And the seed, the free Are they garnet seed. and gold colored? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's a lot of genetic diversity with Seminole pumpkin, so I can't even say what the exact color and shape is going to be until hopefully I get some. And I have seeds for... Um, a new variety of pumpkin called Georgia Bulldog, I think. It was developed by University of Georgia. It's supposed to do well in the summer and be very disease tolerant and resistant. So we're going to see. And I've been starting my um, little shoots for sweet potatoes because I'm going to plant a big patch of sweet potatoes and get a lot of sweet potatoes this year. Okay. And if I get them all in soon, they'll be up and growing and they'll produce in the summer and then hopefully be done around the time of late summer when I'm going to be wanting to put other things in the garden. So, Lily, what kind of natives are blooming now? Chick seed. Coreopsis, go up to North Florida, take a ride. Um, the whole roadsides are yellow with the Coreopsis. Um, black eyes, uh, yeah, Black Eye Susan, some of them, Rudbeckia are still still hanging on. They're not gonna last all summer though. Oh, uh, um, the tuberosa, Asclepius tuberosa. Um, was that sand? Well, it's uh, the, the dry area of milkweeds. Mm -hmm. um, I've got several of those blooming. My day flower, um, what's the other, I can't think of the other, spiderwort that had been blooming, but I think it's wrapping up because um, I have some volunteer spiderwort in my yard. Um, I, don't, I don't get to see it because it is a day flower, but I can see that it has bloomed. <laughs> um, uh, Gallardia. Not really a native anymore, but uh, the blanket flower, that's blooming. What else have you, what's what's blooming right outside you? Oh, the firebush started blooming. Yeah, yeah. Firebush has recovered from the freezes and grown back enough. Scorpions it take long before they start you know, elderberries out. are in bloom, and it, it's amazing to me how many of those things we've actually got in the county. Uh, you go out hmm. and drive around in, in the country, uh, there's elderberry everywhere right now. Uh, cool. They'll just seem to vanish uh, in another month, but mm -hmm. right now it, it's big patches, big mammoth patches of elderberry. And yeah, we have some at our Master Garden Nursery in a little bit of a wet spot, and they're huge. I mean, they grow back yeah. every year. They're they'll hit ten feet tall. When I was a kid, we used to have to go pick the berries, and the, our neighbor made elderberry wine. I knew we were going to get to elderberry wine. No one ever talks about elderberries without elderberry wine. Um, elderberry extract is very popular also for or jelly or jam for dis, for sickness prevention. Don't know if it works. Not that kind of doctor. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, what else I was going to say? Scorpion tail. The, um, I think our wild coffee right out in front of the office is blooming. 
and looks looks really good. Looks really good almost all year long. Uh, yep. Uh, Non-native amaryllis. My amaryllis is blooming for the first time. It was a gift from somebody who attended one of our rain barrel workshops. Gave me some uh, a white amaryllis that's blooming now for the first time, and the lovers are leaving it alone, huh. letting it bloom just nicely. You know, Lily, we're fifty minutes into this today. Shh, shh, shh. We're, not gonna say, we're not going to talk about it. <laughs> and the topic of manure finally comes up. Yeah, and, and it's always Corey <laughs> who blames other people. <laughs> you must be careful when fertilizing with non fully composted animal manure, but elderberries hold their flowers and their berries up high. So you're fairly safe applying manure to your elderberries at ground level. Thank you for that comment, Corey. Mm -hmm. So we have any other questions in the last nine minutes? Get your last questions in. Yeah. I'm going to have, like I said, a lunch and learn tomorrow. If you go to Facebook, you can get the Zoom link. So at noon, uh, unwelcome guests in the garden, assuming I get it done before then. But, you know, and I, I shared all of your events on our page. So okay. that should be on our Facebook page also. Great. Great. From here, I have to go out to... Leadership Hernando's Naturally Hernando Day um, at the at Hernando Beach to give a little talk at 12:30 today, and then I have another appointment at three o'clock, and I'm just going to be running around all the time. So I have a meeting at two, and then I need to get all my stuff done because I'm taking the next week week and a half off. So will you be here next Thursday? No, I will not be. And that reminds me, will you be here next Thursday? Let me check my schedule. Bernie's getting nervous. <laughs> 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 oh, he can handle it. He just needs someone to get him on. What is next Thursday, the 25th? Yes, I'll be here. Yes. I will be here. Don't have anything else there, so I'll be here. Yes, I will be off so I cannot do it. Okay, I will go ahead and set it up for next week, though. Yes. Me and the Bernie man will be here. Maybe I'll come up with a guest. I'll be like Bill and promise a surprise guest and then not really have anyone. <laughs> we have plenty of people to choose from. Yes. Even some new um, people with the county. Mm-hmm. We need to get our new forester on here. Yeah. We need to get our new environmentally sensitive lands coordinator on here. I uh, sent somebody to our new forester. Uh, person had a uh, large group of uh, oak trees and uh, one of them sounded like uh, it could be serious and could be something that could pass on to the other trees. So, uh, I, I thought maybe your best bet would be to get a hold of the forester, and uh, we we have been really lucky, and uh, the the people that have done that job uh, have have really worked hard for the people in our community, and mm -hmm. they've gone out and and checked these trees, and uh, and it doesn't you know, cost you, anything. You know, if you've got multiple mm -hmm. trees, uh, they they come right out, and and uh, they're very, very knowledgeable people. So mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate the fact that we've got a forester again. Uh, I used to use that service a lot. And then it seemed like they, they had a terrible time filling the position for a while. So I, I'm just glad. Well, we had a lot. We had people who would only hold on to it for a short time and then transfer to another county and back in and out. I, I couldn't keep track of who was doing it. As a matter of fact, our last forester, who was here for about a year, plus or minus, I never had a chance to meet. I, I knew his name, but I never met him. And then before you know, boom, he's gone. We have somebody new. But every county in Florida, 
has a county forester. And if so you look they, online, it would be different. Each yeah, county. Yeah. Well, it, it depends. Um, we have been without a forester here in the past. And the Pasco County Forester will be covering Hernando County also. And don't let the term forester throw you. I mean, they will come to your urban yard to give you advice on a tree. Are they going to take it down for you? No. Nope. No. But you will get free advice. And um, yeah, because there is such a thing that exists that's called an urban forest <laughs> that is very important. Each tree affects the other tree. So yeah, they're here for... The community well a lot of the, the tree problems can only be diagnosed uh, by on-site inspection so they send me a picture and the tree is under serious stress but is it a bark beetle is it uh, the the fact they were doing construction and drove over the roots and and it's got some physical damage or uh, is it some fungal disease and and there's really no way to tell without going out and looking and it and some of the trees if, if you don't treat them as soon as they start showing the symptoms they're not salvageable and if, if you've got a a tree you know it's it's two thousand dollars to get this thing taken out it's been there 200 years and uh or two or three hundred dollars we can save it it just makes sense to, to do something to, to try and protect it and uh no. My, my daughter is looking at a home to purchase, not in Hernando, but in the next county up. And it has, she, she didn't tell me what kind of tree, she probably doesn't know, but it is strapped, is split and strapped together. Someone's holding it up. Oh, yeah. You know, there are things arborists can do. I don't think this was done by an arborist. <laughs> it involved... Picture a gargantuan th threaded metal rod that you run through the two parts and you pull it back. There, so there are legitimate ways to fix yeah, that. Yeah, no, it's this is just like, right? you know, one of those straps they use for but, but motors running the rope and stuff. around it and pulling it real tight. Yes. Yeah, so, so, yeah, if she if she gets that place, they will, they will finish pruning that tree at the ground. <laughs> so. Yeah, and about half of the questions I get about trees where picture, people send um, pictures, I can answer. I got a picture of one. Lady said four different people had told her she needs to take it down. And it was a pretty good sized oak tree. And down at about chest high, there was a great big area of bark that had been gone for years and completely rotted out. You could tell the woodpeckers had been dining on the wood inside. And it was getting pretty bad. And I said, I have to agree with everybody else. You probably yeah. want to take that one down. Yes. Unfortunately, you know, trees have a lifespan just like humans. Mm -hmm. we, we, you know, we don't want our human loved ones to go either. But, you know, our bodies only last so long on Earth. And the same is for trees. We can't have the same trees that were here when George Washington was. At least not very many. And some go faster than others, like pine trees. Pine trees pop up quickly, they grow quickly, they die quickly. Yeah, and it's all part of the, you know, recycling of everything on Earth, including mm -hmm. us. We become minerals again, you know, so. It could be expensive. So if you ever have any tree questions, you know, shoot me an email with lots of good pictures, and we'll either answer you answer what your problem is or point you in the right direction and where you can get at least get the answers you know without spending money for the answers and but we don't all we also don't stand to gain any money from it so you know you know we're telling you the truth so if you need to take it down then yeah you'll need to hire an arborist or somebody to take it down yeah uh i work with a couple of really good um arborist services that I would recommend and I do for people who need them. Uh, I will not come out and cut down your tree. Bernie won't either. We can't do that. Uh, mm -hmm. We can recommend people who could do that. If you have a tree that you know has to come down, hiring a tree service is okay. Make sure they're insured and legit. Read some reviews, but that's okay. If you know that the tree is coming down, 
if you're looking for information and advice to have somebody inspect it, you have to call an arborist because they can look at it and tell you what's going on. And then if it still has to be taken down, they can take it down also. And now's the time to do it. Now, I mean, you should have done it a couple months ago, but now it's definitely the time to do it. Don't do it when the weatherman is telling you a hurricane is coming in four days. I mean, be, well, you can try, but those are yeah, well, going to be really busy. Hey, maybe we better have that tree taken down. Yeah. Really you know, while we're talking about this real quick, if if somebody comes by in a pickup truck and says, I'll do a hurricane cut on your palms. Thank you, Bernie. Under no circumstances, do anything but close the door in their face. A uh, hurricane cut is a damaging, terrible thing to do to a palm tree. It's actually illegal in, in at least one county in the state. Uh, it should be illegal in the entire state. But hurricane cuts do not give your tree the ability to withstand a hurricane. All that does is make them weaker and they fall over, get torn up quicker by hurricane if you do a hurricane cut. The uh, trees have been around for thousands of years. They've existed with the hurricanes. They understand hurricanes. That's not a problem. And what uh, do they do? Hurricane what, cutters what do you have you only see? been around since yeah. they've invented the pickup truck. When, when you think of a hurricane and they always show you the palms, and like you said, hurricanes and palms have always coexisted. Um, what do those palms, what are they doing? They do this to flow with the wind. And what are they doing? They're protecting that spearhead or the, you know, the growth point on that palm when they all kind of gather up like a upside down broken umbrella, you know, but they, that's what they're doing. You take those fronds away, then there's nothing to protect that spearhead. And there's also, you are jeopardizing the health of that um, palm. Palms aren't trees. And, um, you know, making it weaker in storms. Palms do a funny thing. They, they take all the nutrition in the bottom leaf and put it into the new growth. And they, they just repeat that cycle. Well, if you cut away all the bottom leaves, you've taken all the future growth and reduced it. So the, the tree, instead of being stronger because you did that, will be weaker because it doesn't have the ability to provide the growth that it should. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, if, if you want to prune palms, uh, the rule is you don't prune anything above the, the straight out. Mm-hmm. Like the three o'clock, just, nine just o'clock. the totally dead leaves. That's all you have to take off. Okay. And people will ask, can I take off the flowers and the, the big, the branch with all the seeds on it and things like that? That's fine. Yeah. You can cut them off at any time. That doesn't hurt the tree taking those off. You want your palm to be a gumdrop shape basically and yeah three o'clock and nine o'clock you can prune under that if you want if you're afraid of projectiles or whatever from the skirt but don't prune anything in that area there as a, as a general rule if you want a healthy palm don't take off anything that still shows green that too even a spot of green yep it's going to turn that green into new growth unless you take it off and then it's going to Turn that green into just nothing but compost. So yeah, that's all I got. Green leaves generally shortens the life of a palm tree, and a lot it's going to make it more susceptible to um, beetles, and it's just a bad thing to do. Because mm-hmm. when they're under stress, they emit some you know some kind of hormone smell, which attracts the beetles. That is a caramone. Okay. Not a pheromone. A caramone. No, caramone. Caramel. All right. It's a stink. The beetles smell and they yes. come flocking. Yeah. Well, it's time to wrap it up, Dr. Lester. Yes, it is. I don't see any other questions on here. So, hey, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. We, somebody will see you next Thursday at 10 a.m. It'll be Lily and Bernie and maybe a special guest. I don't even know who. So, but you somebody will be here next Thursday. <laughs> to uh, answer all your questions and between now and then if you have any questions you know how to get a hold of us just shoot us an email and we'll do our very best to help you figure out what the problem is but until next week um 
Hey, guys. As we'll always, thank, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bye, Bernie. Bye, Bye Bill.